Thanks everyone for taking the time to join the webinar today. My name is Amy Barnes and I'm a policy associate in JPAL's crime, violence and conflict sector. And it's our pleasure to host this event today along with our colleagues in JPAL's governance initiative and IPA's peace and recovery program. This webinar on formal and informal systems of justice provision and dispute resolution is the third in a series of webinars sharing emerging insights from our work to improve the evidence base on governance, crime and conflict over the past three years. Our most recent webinar took place just earlier this month and discussed the role of the state in combating violence against women. I'll ask my colleagues to please add the link to the recording in the chat in case anyone is interested in taking a look at that. And before diving into today's topic, as I mentioned, I'll quickly review our work and the motivation behind this series. Together, JPAL's Crime and Violence Initiative, Governance Initiative, and IPA's Peace and Recovery Program form the Joint Governance, Crime, and Conflict Initiative, or GCCI, supported by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO. Since 2017, GCCI has funded rigorous and policy relevant research, including the research that we're going to discuss today, to determine what works to improve governance and reduce crime, violence, and conflict in low and middle income countries. We support research on a variety of topics, including some of the ones listed on the screen. And this research aims to test solutions to help design better policies and programs to overcome crime, violence, corruption, and instability improve governance, and support recovery and resilience in countries affected by crisis and disaster. The research we support also aims to answer fundamental questions about these topics, whose answers can provide more generalizable insights to inform programming and practice in a variety of contexts, and not just those where research was implemented. We're lucky to have a wonderful group of academic advisors that guide this work, and you can see them here. To date, we've funded over 90 studies in almost 40 countries. And as I mentioned, over the next few months through this webinar series, we're excited to continue sharing with you what we've been learning from our supported research during the first three years of this initiative. But today in particular, we're excited to delve into a very important research and policy question, especially relevant in context with limited state capacity. That is, how can the state strengthen formal systems of justice provision and build citizen trust in the state? And how can informal dispute resolution systems complement or undermine these efforts? And since one study today does involve access to the police, we wanna briefly acknowledge beforehand that this is a challenging topic, especially given recent events around the world involving police brutality. We also acknowledge that the topic of justice provision is very sensitive this week in light of the trial and conviction of Derek Chauvin in George Floyd's murder trial. While today's webinar will focus on emerging evidence from outside of the US, we hope that today's discussion may also shed light on how different forms of state and non-state dispute resolution and justice provision can be improved, especially in order to serve marginalized populations, and that it can help us touch upon the potential and limitations of state institutions in providing justice. Again, we're very lucky to have four panelists today who are deeply immersed in this question and from different perspectives. First, Bilal Siddiqui is the Director of Research at the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley, and he'll share an introduction of the literature on state and non-state justice provision, framing what we know so far about this topic. Then we'll hear from Anna Wilk, a PhD candidate in political science at Columbia University. She'll share evidence from her randomized evaluation, how does the state replace the community, experimental evidence on crime control from South Africa. Then we have James Robinson, a university professor at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. He's also the Institute Director of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, and will present his lab and field research project, Trust in State and Non-State Actors, Evidence from Dispute Resolution in Pakistan. Finally, we have Peter Evans, the team leader of FCDO's Research Commissioning Team for Governance, Conflict, Inclusion, and Humanitarian Research. He will speak to the policy implications of this research and how the results can be interpreted and applied in practice. Before jumping in, we'll quickly cover some housekeeping. We're going to start with presentations from each panelist and then open the floor to a Q&A session. Um, if you'd like to ask a question during the event, 
feel free to submit them through the Q&A function that Zoom has and share your name, name and affiliation if you're comfortable so our panelists will know who the question is coming from. You can feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar, but we likely will not answer them until the end. And we also may not be able to answer all of the questions, so we do apologize for that in advance. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch after the event is over. So we appreciate you sharing the link to any colleagues uh, you think might be interested in this topic. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Bilal. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and let him take over uh, for a bit and we're gonna hear from him. We might've lost the law, let's see. All right, maybe we can come back to him in a minute and we can let Anna jump in. And if we have time, we can come back to the law. That sounds good. Will you okay. share the slides? Yeah, perfect. Yes. All right. All right, let's hear from Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the organizers and for the opportunity to um, pre present the findings of my study in this forum. Um, uh, as was already said, the, this project is called How Does the State Replace the Community? Experimental Evidence on Crime Control from South Africa. Next slide. So um, in this project, I'm interested in one particular um, pretty widespread informal alternative to the state's justice system that has been called um, mob justice, mob violence, or as I will call it here, mob vigilantism. All these terms really refer to um, situations in which ordinary community members punish criminal suspects. To give you a sense of the phenomenon that I'm talking about, in this picture you can see uh, what has once been a house of a resident of the police precinct in South Africa where the study is set. And what has happened here is that the owner of this house was accused of stealing a plasma TV. And in response to that, a group of men from the community came together, came to his house, and when they couldn't find him at home, completely demolished the house. Um, and the general sense was that the person was quite lucky to not have been at home because he would have otherwise been gravely assaulted or even killed. So um, as in this example, mob vigilantism is a form of violence that is typically perpetrated by ordinary citizens and often results in really brutal and quite public assaults on criminal suspect, suspects. And of course, um, this practice operates entirely outside the law. Next slide. So um, official statistics on mob vigilantism are somewhat rare, but anecdotal accounts and the data that we do have suggest that this is a really widespread phenomenon around the developing world. So here you can see data that were collected by the World Justice Project in 2017 um, through a survey of urban residents around the world. And in the survey, respondents were asked, assume that a criminal is apprehended by your neighbor after committing a serious crime, which of the following two situations is more likely to happen? Will the neighbors pass over the criminal to the police unharmed or will the criminal be beaten by the neighbors? And when you look at the um, countries shaded in red on this map, you can see that in a whole variety of contexts, more than 40% of respondents say that the criminal would be beaten by neighbors. Next slide. Um, now, the prevalence of this kind of extrajudicial punishment has really severe downsides. First of all, I have already mentioned that mob vigilantism can lead to really gruesome violence. Um, in South Africa, for example, um, data provided by the police suggests that um, vigilante mobs kill around two people every day. But even beyond that, um, when citizens are reluctant, I think you need to go back one more, thank you. Um, when citizens are reluctant to um, cooperate with state institutions, this may also further undermine the effectiveness of these institutions. So typically we think, for example, that police need information provided by citizens to effectively combat crime. And so we may want citizens to turn to police and not to mock vigilantism when they experience crime. So, so the relevant policy question then becomes how can we discourage mock vigilantism and encourage citizens to cooperate with police? Now we can go to the next slide. 
Um, so mob vigilantism, as well as the prevalence of other um, informal um, alternatives to the state's justice system, is often attributed to the weakness of state law enforcement institutions like the police. That's the case both in the literature, but also when you talk to people who are engaged in these kinds of practices. So in South Africa, for example, one respondent said to me, well, it is not a good thing to take the law into your own hands, but since the police is not doing a good job, people have no other option. So this form of violence is very much attributed to the weakness of um, or the ineffectiveness of police. But even though these arguments are really prevalent, we actually have little direct evidence that police presence discourages mob vigilantism. And we also don't know much about the mechanisms that may drive um, an effect of police presence on mob vigilantism. Next slide. So um, the idea of this study is to introduce some variation in the presence of police on the very local level by equipping certain households in a given police precinct with a police alarm system. I will talk you more, tell you more about this alarm system in a second, but the basic idea is that this alarm system links the household directly to the police, makes it easier to reach out and easier for the police to find the household. Um, before I will tell you more about it, let me, let me uh, foreshadow what we can learn from the study. So essentially the results of the study suggest that police presence in the form of having this police alarm system increases the willingness to cooperate with police and has reduced the willingness to resort to mob vigilantism. I then also try to understand, well, what are the mechanisms that drive these changes? And what I find is that this might not necessarily be due to people who have an alarm becoming more positive about relying on the police as an alternative, but instead that they have developed an expectation that if they were to take the law into their own hands, they would be arrested by the police and would face uh, punishment by the state. All right, next slide. Okay, let me tell you a bit about where the study takes place. So this evaluation takes place in a semi-urban police precinct in South Africa's Northwest province. This place is what South Africans call a township. It's a predominantly black township um, and townships <coughs> are sort of similar to urban slums in other parts of the world. The thing to know about this place is that the risk of becoming a victim of crime is really a daily reality here. So this is a place with very high rates of violent and property crime. And it is also a place where people are quite dissatisfied with the police. So one of the main complaints about the police is that they would never show up if they were called or that they take either a very long time to show up or do not show up at all if they are called to a crime scene. This is also a context where we do not really have sort of institutionalized uh, non-state alternatives to the state's justice system. So in other work, you'll see uh, people study gangs or organized vigilante groups or um, sort of traditional authorities as providers of dispute resolution services. But in this context, this decentralized mob vigilantism phenomenon that I have talked about is really the main alternative to the state that people rely on. We can move on to the next slide. Yes, so the intervention that I study, I already mentioned it, is this home-based police alarm system, which was developed by a South African nonprofit organization that works really closely with the South African police service. So this alarm system consists of an electronic device that you can see here in the picture that gets installed in a person's home. And it can be activated using either a panic button or a cell phone. When it's activated, it sends um, a text message to the personnel at the closest police station that is on duty during that time. And these text messages include um, the names and contact details of the alarm owners. And this information is also already on file at the police station. Now the alarm can be triggered silently or such that um, a loud siren sounds and a light flashes at the outside of the alarm owner's house. So the idea of this treatment is to bring the police in some sense closer to the people in the community by giving them a, a direct line to the police and making it easier for police to find a given household when there is a problem there. Let's move on. Yes, so this study is um, based on 250 households that all um, are located within the same police precinct. And 100 of these households were assigned to receive the police alarm system. They were randomly assigned. So the idea is that we can compare the households that did receive the alarm to those that did not receive the alarm to understand um, the effect of the alarm system on both people's views of the police and their, um, their approach to mob vigilantism. Now I measure these outcomes using two waves of household surveys that took place respectively one and eight months after these alarms were installed. 
Um, and during those outcome measurement phases, I interviewed one woman and one man in every household. Let's move on. Okay, so here we come to the um, main results of the study. So um, everything that I will show you pertains to data that have been collected at endline. So we are looking at results um, at, uh, after eight months after the alarms were installed. Um, also, these effects are estimated among a subsample of people who were particularly pessimistic about the police at baseline. Um, for those who are interested, this um, analysis was pre-registered prior to the study being completed. So let's focus first on the picture on the left. Um, so here I plot the average willingness of um, participants to um, participate in beating up a criminal suspect. Um, so this is a survey measure. It's an index of multiple questions that ask about that that ranges from zero to one. The left column um, plots the average willingness to participate in mob vigilantism, in mob vigilantism among people who uh, did not receive the alarm system. And the right bar pertains to people who did receive the alarm system. So in comparing the two bars, we see that it seems that the alarm system reduces the willingness to participate in mob vigilantism by around 50%. So there's quite a substantial effect on um, the willingness to resort to mob vigilantism among this group. On the right, I turn to people's willingness to cooperate with police. So here I rely on a survey measure of whether people are willing to reach out to police if they are about to be victimized by crime um, or and whether they are willing to share information with police more generally about crime. Um, and so here we see that the alarm treatment seems to increase uh, the willingness to cooperate with police by 0.14 scale points. Again, this ranges from zero to one. And so that's roughly equivalent to 25%, a 25% increase from the control group mean of 0.61. So overall, we have some evidence that this um, increase in police presence in the form of installing this um, police alarm system in a person's house has reduced the willingness to resort to mob vigilantism and increased the willingness to rely on police. Let's move on. Now, the question is, of course, why does this treatment have these effects? And so um, I document two kinds of changes that could be uh, drivers of the effects that we see. So first of all, I show that people who received this alarm became somewhat more positive in their perceptions of the quality of services that police provide. So for example, if people who got this alarm system think that the police would arrive more quickly when they are called to a person's house. But on the other hand, people also um, developed a, a sense of increased police supervision. Remember that um, the names and contact details, et cetera, of alarm owners are on file at the police station even if someone doesn't trigger their alarm. And so it does seem that people develop the sense that they are more known to police or less anonymous in the eyes of police. Um, and so we do see that people with an alarm think it more likely that the police would find out if they themselves committed a crime in general. And they also think that it is more likely that they would go to prison if they took the law into their own hands. Now, I do a number of tests in the study to figure out which of these changes might be more important in driving the reduction in the willingness to participate in mob vigilantism that we see. And generally, it seems that the second mechanism, I think we can go to the next slide, the second mechanism, exactly, um, is more important here, that these, this reduction in the willingness to participate in mob vigilantism is really driven by this expectation that if you took the law into your own hands, you would face punishment by the state. All right, let's move on. So what can we learn from the study sort of in a broader sense? Well, first of all, it seems that police presence, at least in the form that it took here, can discourage mob vigilantism and encourage reliance on police. Um, and this is especially true among groups that were really pessimistic about the police and what they can do at the outset. Moreover, these mechanisms, uh, mechanism results that I have, seem to suggest that the reason why police presence may have these effects may not necessarily be that the police are now perceived as a better alternative to rely on by people who have this alarm system, but instead citizens may have come to expect repercussions for their involvement in vigilantism. And in fact, some other results that I have suggest that the expansion of police presence may be most effective in discouraging mob vigilantism when citizens believe that police are committed um, to fighting vigilantism or policing this particular kind of violence um, specifically. All right, let's move on. Well, 
So one thing to keep in mind is that this really is only one study. Um, and uh, so we shouldn't overinterpret the results that we see here. There are many questions that remain open. Um, and I'll just mention a few of those now. Um, first of all, the study is based entirely on outcome measures that have been collected through surveys. And so an important question is whether we would see the same results if we had measurement, measurements of actual behavior, if we, for example, had crime data that show us whether people indeed um, do participate less in mock vigilantism. A second, perhaps even more important question is, um, in this study, uh, we have increased police presence in a somewhat unconventional way. Um, states don't usually increase police presence by giving people police alarm systems. And so an important question is whether these effects would generalize to other ways of increasing police presence that are more conventional, such as, for example, building more police stations, hiring more police officers, having more pat police patrols, etc. Um, and there's also like a more specific question about, about the degree to which the police alarm is a scalable solution to um, the absence or weakness of police um, in these township environments. Um, it's important to keep in mind that in this study, we gave a very small number of police alarms to uh, 100 households in a police precinct that has 42,000 residents. So that makes it a quite intensive treatment because with only 100 alarms in a precinct, police have quite a lot of capacity to concentrate on these 100 households. But results may look very different if we gave, gave 1,000 or 10,000 people in this um, police precinct an alarm. And so this is something that this study cannot speak to. And then finally, um, sort of in line with what Amy said at the very beginning of this um, webinar, um, especially uh, in this week today with the things happening in the world, um, we should be really cautious in general about um, incre the increase of police presence as a policy recommendation, because of course, with an increase in police presence, um, there also comes an increased potential for police abuse. Um, I'm very happy to talk more about what we, um, sort of the precautions we did in this study we had in the study to deal with this problem, but I think in general, as we think through whether and how to increase police presence, we also need to think about how to protect citizens uh, against police abuse. And I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Anna. So up next, we're going to hear from James Robinson, and he'll speak on his uh, research in Pakistan. So James, whenever you're ready. Yes, thanks. This is a this is a study with uh, Daron uh, Ashimolu at MIT, Ali Chima, who's uh, in Lums in Lahore, and Asim uh, Kwaja, who's at the Kennedy School. So, so, so let me say something about about the motivation for this uh, project, which may not be obvious uh, in the way it's written up. Uh, so, there's a sort of agenda here, uh, which which I think is a sort of important agenda, and and that's kind of, you know why are we looking at dispute. Uh, resolution uh, as a sort of focus for trying to understand the relationship between the state and society. I think e economists working in this space are really obsessed with uh, taxation and everything is about taxation and we have to increase taxation, we have to make tax collection more effective. But actually, if you look at the history of state formation, that what states do to start with is not collect taxes, they resolve disputes. You know, if you read John Locke's uh, second treatise of government, Locke starts by characterizing uh, the state of nature, what he calls the inconveniences of the state of nature. And the main problem with the state of nature, a sort of stateless society, is that uh, people get into a disputes with each other. And somebody who has a stake in the dispute has to, has to decide who's right and who's wrong. So there's no, so what Locke says is you need third party dispute resolution, you know, this is the most critical thing that you need a state for, to be a kind of dispute resolver, you know. And I think you see that time and time again in archeological or ethnographic studies of the history of the state. You know, what did Muhammad do when he went from Mecca to Medina? Why was he brought in by the clans of Medina? To resolve disputes, that's what he did. If you look in uh, Bantu, you know, Jan van Sina pointed this out in Proto-Bantu, you know, if you take these words like chief or words for political leaders or authority in uh, Bantu languages, the root of that is always someone who resolves dispute, basically. It's always about disputes. 
so 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 the the sort of bigger agenda this is not discussed in the paper uh but but i'm just sort of saying like from our perspective uh you know there's a very big set of issues here that people haven't grappled with at all in this literature you know because they're so fixated with public finance kind of issues but before you get to raising taxes you have to provide much more fundamental in our view services to to people and so i think that's that's good to bear in mind and there's many many things i could say and talk about but let me go to the specific study here okay so 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 think of the terrain that as the terrain you know and think of the terrain as a state trying to kind of emerge and consolidate itself and develop a reputation for solving disputes but surrounded by all sorts of other entities and state like actors who are simultaneously uh, trying to provide what people want, trying to resolve uh, disputes. So the main context is trying to understand, you know, how could we, what sort of interventions or what sort of perturbations might make the central state or, you know, the constitutional state become stronger, you know, and, 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 and more trustworthy or more legitimate in the eyes of the citizens. So, so we were, we're sort of trying to think about this uh, in the context of Pakistan, you know, and, and we can keep, keep going. Uh, right, so, so we're trying to do this in the context of Pakistan, you know, why Pakistan? I could talk about that in a minute, but obviously Pakistan is a very interesting case because it's a situation where there's enormous numbers of non-state actors providing different sorts of services, including dispute uh, resolution. And there's a state, a national state, you know, in competition with these, with these, with these other, with these other entities. Okay. So, so what we did in this study is we designed a sort of perturbation, which is really about exposing in, its citizens to real information about the effectiveness of the state. And we were interested in seeing how that changes their, their attitudes sort of expressed in a survey and beliefs, and all the, also their real behavior captured in two, uh, two experimental games where there's kind of real money involved and, and the payoff to doing different actions, I'll describe those games in a minute, well, you know, I'll describe those games in, in a minute in more detail, but, but the payoff to those, you can sort of invest in the state or you can invest in the non-state non actor, and the payoff to those investments depends on the effectiveness of those different actors or your perceptions of the effectiveness of those dis different actions. So we want to perturb that situation uh, by revealing to people, you know, real information, not made up information, real information about the success or the, the effectiveness of the state in Pakistan. And then we want to see how people react. And in, in the paper, we're particularly interested in this, this interaction, you know, between state and non-state and you know if i trust more are they complements or are they substitutes and there's actually some very interesting theoretical points which i'm not going to get into but and which is in the appendix of the published paper about the extent to which you know just putting my theorist theorist hat on for a second the extent to which sort of standard bayesian rationality can explain what we find in the data or you need a more behavioral type of argument based on motivated uh reasoning and that's actually seems to us much more consistent so i won't talk about theory uh, anymore unless people force me to so 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 okay but you know I, I you know this is part of a much longer term agenda i think we have uh uh okay let's go all right you know why pakistan probably everybody here understands why pakistan because there's such a proliferation of different actors you know there's religious groups there's you know there's there's Taliban, you know, everyone thinks of the Taliban, uh, you know, why did the Taliban become so powerful in uh, Afghanistan? Because it filled this enormous vacuum of authority uh, and, and it was able to provide security and services at a local level to start with. And that's, that's, that's how it grew. So I think the stakes of understanding this are very important. Also, you know, tribal governments, that's not a word you'd use if we were talking about Africa. Uh, and then there's these panchayats, and the panchayats is what we ended up working with. This is, you know, this is this is not this is different from panchayats in in India. In in, in India, the panchayats have this kind of constitutional role. You know, there's been very seminal research on the panchayats and the role of the panchayats in India. In in Pakistan, it's the same word, but they're much more informal and they're not sort of constitutionalized. You don't elect the leader in the same way you elect the pradhan. 
in India. So it's that. So I'm just sort of they're, they're different, but they're different but similar. You know, in that in that they're they're local groups of elders who kind of resolve disputes and solve problem in the community, not using constitutional sanctions, but using you know ostracism, social enforcement, and things like that. But but they do solve. They do resolve, you know, the fieldwork suggested this was the perfect kind of entity to compare with, you know, the de jure court system to like look at this interaction between state and non-state. So, we, we, you know, this is just to motivate. There's a lot of interesting things going on in Pakistan in this space, but obviously we're not doing this with the Taliban. And, you know, we could have done it with the tribal governments, but but I think this was Ali and Asim kind of made the call that this was this was the right forum to do it in and and that's what we did. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, go, yeah, go on. Let, let's, let's, let's not talk about... Yeah, so I said a little bit about panchayats. There's a lot more detail. Uh, you know, what's, what's nice about panchayats is they're very local. Uh, you know, they're sort of familiar. They're, they're cheap. Uh, they're very accessible. You know, you don't have to go into Lahore or into some town, you know, and, and, and so, or where maybe you have to bribe somebody or whatever. And they seem to be very highly used, so it's not some kind of marginal thing. So that's that's good. Uh, keep going, but but you know, so they're accessible. People are familiar with that. You know, uh, yeah, the, the uh, you know, but but the, but there may be a cost also. Okay, so 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 I differ from India. I mentioned that you know, there's a cost. So this is just, you know, there's some there's some decisions that panchayats make that seem you know. Uh, for Westerners anyway, or for outsiders seem, you know, outrageous. And so, so I don't know if they seem outrageous to the local people in Pakistan, that's a different question, but, but for, for Westerners, they seem outrageous. Uh, and, you know, but that, you know, there are examples of, you know, arbitrariness as well. So, you know, there's less institutionalized checks and balances on these institutions as well. So, so that, you know, there may well be, there may well be, there may well be costs. Okay. So, so let me let me talk about you know what we did. We uh, we randomly sampled about over three thousand uh, uh, male household heads, uh, which kind of fieldwork suggested you know was the group most likely to be dealing with disputes. We tried to sat, uh, uh, stratify the the sampling by by caste, uh, and we ended up with about three, over three thousand respondents from forty villages, and this is in a particular district uh, in Punjab. Uh, Sargoda, which is, you know, northwest of Lahore, uh, there's Pakistan on the right, and there's Sargoda and Lahore. So, so, so here's Lahore. Yeah. So, so that's, that's where we collected all the data. And then, you know, the main treatment is we say, we call it state positive. So we did, we did different things. And this is, let me, let me just talk about that. Uh, we, you know, we, you could do like, you know, we could reveal positive information about the state or negative information, and we could reveal positive information about the non-state, about the panchayat, or, you know, so there's there's different alternatives, but let me just focus on uh, the state positive. So the state positive, this is a real thing, you know, first of all, there's a sort of baseline, and, you know, then we, we see how people play these games, and we survey them, and I'll re discuss the games in more detail shortly, and then we reveal this information, and the information is, the legal system and judges have formed a new judicial policy. This policy was introduced in Multan and has resolved 6,000 pending cases in two months. So this is a real thing. This is not made up. This is a real thing that happened in Multan. For this reason, Multan's number of total open court cases has decreased 20%. So the state, here's some information about the state actually efficiently resolving court cases. Oh. This policy has now been implemented in Sargoda, and it's estimated that pending cases could potentially be resolved within a year. So here's real information, you know, that the state is doing stuff and it's resolving disputes in an efficient way or more efficient. There's also, you know, that we do a lot of different sorts of placebos in the paper because there's all these concerns about, you know, experimenter demand and, you know, so, and, and also we, you know, we, we, we look at, do you want to invest in other things that are kind of, so, so there's lots of placebos, which I won't go into, to try to convince you that this is actually really capturing what we say it is, meaning uh, you get information that the courts are working more efficiently, then you're more likely to actually, you know, believe that the courts are effective. You're more willing to sort of invest in activities involving the court. And here's the interesting thing. You substitute out of non-state. So it's that substitution, which is the interesting thing, theoretically, it turns out not to be obvious, theoretically. And, you know, which is, which is interesting, you know, because it sort of says, 
you know, this, you, you get information about the state and it creates this sort of virtuous circle whereby people actually substitute into using the state. Uh, so, so, you know, so here's just, you know, like, for example, to look at this, what we call this social experimenter treatment. So I've been thinking about the current state of affairs and how the state's been dealing with everything. And while I don't really know how great a state job state institutions are doing, in my personal opinion, I really like the state system. So that's just, that's not information. It's not information. It's just a kind of vague, you know, so we want to test whether that elicits the same response, for example, you know, because if that elicited the same response, then maybe people are sort of sitting there thinking, oh, he wants me to, he wants me to behave in this particular way. Okay, so, so, so that's, we do a lot of stuff like that. So let me, let's go on. I mean, let me talk about the, the outcome measures. Okay, so, so, so we, we, we ask all these surveys, I'll show, I can show you a little bit about that if I have time. But the most interesting bit are these experimental uh, games. So let's let's talk about the experimental games. Okay, so one is the fun dictator game. Uh, and here, you know, it's like a classic dictator game. People have 250 Pakistani rupees and they have to decide, you know, whether to allocate it to themselves or whether to allocate it to a fund which is used, you know, by community members in the courts or the panchayats. And so you allocate. So, and the idea here is that you're going to be more generous to the courts or the panchayats if you think they're more effective. So that's the first game, the fun dictator game. And then we have something called the investment game. And the investment game is you're told that there's a, there's a dispute and the dispute could be either in, in the court system or in the panchayat. And you can allocate money to, 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 to help in this, in, to help your, to help in this dispute. You know, the person is, you know, the plaintiff was rightfully owned remuneration. So you want to help the plaintiff, but the return in the game. So you have 250, you put, you know, you put in, you can invest X in this. The return on that X is based on the efficiency of the system. So if you think that, that if you think that, that, that the court is completely inefficient, then giving it money is just throwing money away. But if you think it's efficient, then then you know, then 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 that's a good thing. So 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 we you know so again so what we announce is that you know the efficiency is based on the real efficiency, and then you know we shock people's information, and the idea is people should believe that the court system is more efficient, and they should be more willing to invest in this case. Okay, so so we can just look at the results, and then then I'll run out of time. Okay, so this is keep going. That's how we did it. I can talk more about that. Here's the descriptive statistic keep going so here's the, the i can just show you two tables you know there's two here's the basic results okay so so just focus on columns two and three one is just sort of survey evidence two and three this is this is the state positive treatment on state courts and this and let's just focus on panel a so this positive coefficient here and here means that that at the individual level sort of so you have individuals before and then we reveal the information then after once you reveal this information, they're significantly more likely to allocate money to the state courts and invest in the state courts in helping resolve this dispute. Okay, so 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 that's 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 the you know, the information they update. And if you go to the next slide, and this is the sort of fascinating theoretical thing, it goes in the opposite opposite direction. So we didn't in this treatment here, we didn't say anything about the panchayats. We didn't tell people anything about the panchayats, but people substitute out of using the panchayats. I mean, this is not data on usage, but like in 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 in, in, in it's it's you know I give less money to the panchayats. I, when I give more money to the courts, I give less money to the panchayats. So there's a sort of movement. If I perturb beliefs about the state, there's a kind of movement out of the non-state actors into the state so that substitution in some sense is what the whole paper is about like from a kind of social science point of view like trying to understand and conceptualize that substitution but of course from a practical point of view it's very it's very powerful because it sort of says you know if i can work on one margin then the other margin is going to respond endogenously without me doing anything about it so trying to understand those equilibrium effects of those general equilibrium effects of dispute resolution seems to be enormously important from a policy perspective. So I think, you know, there's both a big kind of intellectual agenda here, uh, which, which we think is important, but also it seems to have very practical important, it, you know, seems to have very practical implications in terms of strengthening the state and kind of simultaneously weakening perhaps other actors, you know, uh, who you may be, 
you know, I don't know if the other actors are better or worse than the Pakistani state. You know, I, 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 I'm not an expert on Pakistan. Obviously, you know, we're highly reliant on the wisdom of Ali and Asim here, you know, uh, but, but okay, fine. So I think, I think I said all I need to say, yeah. All right, thanks, James. So I think that we have Bilal back on the line now. So it would be great if uh, we could hear from you. I'll stop sharing my screen and let you take over. Um, are you able to see um, see the presentation? Yep, yeah, but it's uh, not in the presenter mode. There you go. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, thank you everyone for um, for the invitation, but also thank you so much, James and Anna, for those uh, fantastic uh, presentations. Um, this subject is very close to my heart. This is where I started um, my uh, my graduate uh, uh, sort of study was was in Liberia working um, on multiple dispute resolution systems, specifically the formal and the customary system in Liberia. And since then, I've been doing similar work in Pakistan, in Sierra Leone, and so on. And so, been thinking about these questions for a while. Um, and it is just um, just such a pleasure to see uh, the studies. Today, engaging with the foundational questions that these um, uh, that the coexistence of formal and informal dispute resolution systems really do raise. Um, my pick, my plan here is really to provide a, a kind of big picture view and try and place uh, the two studies in a slightly larger context, um, informed in large part also by some of uh, the work done by James and and uh, and uh, Daron and and co-authors is uh, earlier work on the formation of legal institutions and political institutions and and how how in fact um, kind of both these studies really get at some of these uh, questions right at the heart of of that broader debate about how institutions form and func function and how uh, whose interests they serve. So, as you may have gleaned from the from the last two um, presentations, multiple dispute resolution systems exist, and it's um, in, in the broader economic literature before some of this most more recent work over the last couple of uh, uh, decades. Um, there was a very simple notion of how people resolve disputes um, that people have a dispute. They go to court or an appropriate legal institution and they resolve it. And essentially, legal disputes, uh, this is a quote from Kutter and Rubenfeld back in uh, 1989 from, uh, I think, a JEL article uh, that summarized the state of law and economics at the time. It is that essentially the contribution was that legal disputes are resolved at various stages of a very sequential decision making process in which parties have limited information and act in their own self interest. And the idea was that there's this kind of almost bargaining uh, approach um, where, in a particular forum, people have, have threat points, people have information, people have some kinds of risk preferences. Um, and along, because, uh, uh, or along those dimensions, they actually decide who wins, who loses, who gets what. And, and rational incentives can, within a given system, govern that set of choices. Um, the, a lot of these issues are, while, while the framework remains important and solid, a lot of these kinds of assumptions get thrown up the moment you enter into a world of legal pluralism, where there is this coexistence of multiple dispute resolution systems. And the key notion that is clear in both these studies as well is that in, in most developing countries, informal systems are really the forum of choice. It seems to be very clear that because in these uh, in, in developing countries in particular, the, state, the, the reach of the state is often limited and often contested and, and um, not necessarily um, trusted, um, it the vast majority of disputes are, are resolved um, 
in various stages of um, of the um, of, of informal systems, and that and going to courts and going to formal dispute resolution alternatives <clears throat> is really a uh, a last choice. And so the real question here is: Is this a problem? Is it a problem that people go to informal systems, and if so, for whom? And um, one of the kind of foundational texts that I always refer to is. Uh, um, Mahmoud Bamdani's um, Citizen and Subject, which really uh, focuses on, I think, and derives from a lot of the, his experiences in South Africa, but more generally kind of acknowledges first and foremost that legal institutions emerge from a struggle between fiercely competing groups. And in the context of colonial Africa, um, he describes justice as a deracialized legal apartheid. Um, he basically makes the argument that as part of the project of uh, colonialism, which often relied on indirect rule, that formal rights were really restricted to a select few citizens, the rural poor were relegated to the decentralized despotism of customary rule. And essentially at the end of the day, the fact that there are multiple systems today is not, um, is not necessarily, um, a good thing. It's um, in fact, if anything, it preserves the power relations that came as in during the, the, the process of the formation of the state in colonial Africa. And a lot of these same kind of dynamics, I think, play, around, play in other parts of the world that the informal systems, while they have plenty of, of uh, uh, things that, that, they, that are, they're good for, are also, also have um, uh, this history of uh, separation that actually prevented these two systems from really co-evolving. And so part of the project, and I'll come back to this in more, is really to think about the interaction between these two systems rather than to try and um, simply uh, understand whether in any either of these individual systems is actually functioning well. So that brings us to these two studies. The, main contribution or one of the main contributions of both these studies that I really sort of enjoy and enjoyed uh, learning about is that information itself can change forum choice. Um, and by that, it, I mean simply informing people as James and co colleagues do in Pakistan about the quality of uh, the courts or um, as uh, Anna does in South Africa about the actions of uh, the police, um, both of these seem to be able to change how people think and uh, in, in, in certain ways interact with or behave um, around these institutions. Um, so this is a huge, uh, deal because at the end of the day, if we go back to the Mamdani setting, these systems are set up in these worlds that that exist separately. And what James and Anna's studies show is actually that simple bits of simple things like information and, and kinds of um, uh, you know targeted uh, updates can actually change in behavior and uh, beliefs. And um, for very different reasons, in uh, the study by James and, and his co-authors, it's about the, um, the fact that people update about the quality of the formal system. And in Anna's case, it's, a, it's slightly uh, perhaps uh, scarier in that people update about the threat of punishment if they use the informal system, which is, which is in, in this case, great, but it is ultimately coming from this kind of coercion. This brings us back to, for me, it brought me back to this question of why the formal system? You know, there's two distinct rationales really to think about how, why you may want to push people towards the formal system. So one is that the formal system is really codifying and simplifying customary rules and practices. And it is really a, a better, uh, more predictable, more uh, uh, sort of organized version of the informal system. And this does not really seem to be the, the case in either of these studies. In fact, it's, this, it's more the second rationale that formal systems really aim at creating a change that the custom seems to inhibit. And in particular, 
that, that these systems are really in conflict with each other. Um, in both these instances, pushing people towards the formal system really does seem to be coming out of this broader understanding that the, the, there's something missing in the customary system uh, or in these informal systems. And I think implicit in this, but something that I am really curious about going forward is how do these systems really compete and co-evolve, right? We know that these systems differ in many ways in form. So courts are adversarial, uh, police are uh, meant to punish crimes, um, whereas informal systems are tend to be uh, much more uh, mediatory and provide remedies rather than punishments. Um, there are huge differences in costs in terms of the fees, the distances, the delays and the, the, the speed of, uh, of dispute processing and so on. And so there is this world where you're really talking about how multiple systems give these give citizens choices and citizens could literally be voting with their feet by choosing to take a dispute here or there. And that forum choice as in a, it's a kind of a Tibu style framework should really provide competition. And that competition in principle should improve not just not, should not necessarily just send people towards one system, but actually help both the systems improve and and um, lower their costs, improve the, the way that the disputes are resolved and ideally provide a larger set of people um, uh, in the access to to justice, um, including those that have traditionally been discriminated against in the past. Um, and so one of the really important open questions I think that I would love to see going forward is, does this kind of competition change how these institutions work and the nature of judicial decisions and outcomes in the leakage and the delays and the efficiency of the institutions themselves? The second, which uh, Anna and James have both recognize, is trying to understand behavior in the real world. So does this kind of uh, information-based uh, sort of intervention translate to cho forum choice in the real world? Do we see uh, information as being a sufficiently or relaxing the information constraint as being sufficient in helping people um, change where they go? Um, largely, the costs of using the formal system are pervasive and diverse. Um, informal systems exert tremendous social power. Exiting these systems is extremely costly, particularly for groups that are vulnerable and don't have that set of choices. And so that I think is a is a is a much broader and bigger project, but one that I would love to see more on. And finally, on um, uh, I would love to understand a little bit more about these general equilibrium effects. What happens once people start to change these choices? Um, at some level, what we care about are is 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 the next step. We want to sort of make sure these systems are not overburdened. But the moment you provide choices, you may also encourage um, uh, disputes um, on the margins of reporting to be to turn up in these systems. So they may become overburdened. Um, you may see different types of crimes and disputes actually being reported. You may see changes in reporting behavior, but also changes in the incidence of crimes and disputes. You may see shifts in legal norms and values. And ultimately, what we really care about shifts in the power relations in society. And so really, all of these kinds of downstream effects um, are, are such grand and uh, important objectives. And I would love to sort of see the, the next uh, set of studies in this in this dimension kind of focusing um, moving forward and building on this and focusing on these kinds of effects. Thank you so much. Um, handing over to handing back over to Amy now. Thanks, Lul. Uh, so our final panelist that we're going to hear from today, is Evans from FCDO, and he's going to give kind of the policy perspective. Um, since he doesn't have slides for this portion of the presentation, I'm not going to share my screen again, and we'll just uh, listen to Peter. Thanks. Hi, uh, I hope you can hear me. Can you see me too? Yes. Okay, great stuff. So um, thank you. So my name is Peter Evans and I uh, work for the UK government's uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. Um, I work in the research and evidence department. So we're very pleased to, to have worked with and funded um, the brilliant work by JPAL and IPA, including the GCCI as Amy introduced. Um, 
before this role, I was, so I lead the team, but before I, I became a research commissioner, I was a, a governance practitioner. So in frontline governance roles in DFID offices in Bangladesh, India, um, and Malawi, amongst other, other places. So um, Amy sent me rather a, a grand challenge about the current state of programming on the strength and informal and informal systems of dispute resolution and building trust in state institutions of justice. So I'll have a go at that, but I'll, I'll try and um, offer thoughts from my own earlier practice, but focus also particularly on, on where evidence fits into policy and practice for FCDO, but also its partners. And I'll try and pick out a thread um, between the research that we are we're funding, very happy to fund, and where practice is evolving. So in my team, when we talk about um, security and justice, access to justice, um, we often talk in, in sort of grand system forms. And one question I always ask is, so what are the particular interventions we're most commonly focusing on? Um, and so there can be a, a disjunct between the sort of the, the, the grand level outcome and intent and the actual bits of the system that we um, seek to collect evidence on. And for me, this is a bit of a challenge because the, the evidence is quite fresh and young and it tends to operate at the, the interventional level. But the, our ambition is often much grander than that. Now, when I was um, a, a DFID governance advisor, uh, I worked on police reform programs in Malawi, Bangladesh, and India of various scales. Now, some of these, particularly the Malawi um, Access to Justice program in the early uh, 2000s, was basically attempting to, to embrace the whole system. Um, and typically, these programs were, were led by police and justice sector experts, often from the north, global north. And they tried to do a bit of everything. Um, they weren't so good at outcomes in terms of stating them. They were more like input, you know, let's have a grand set of inputs. When I worked in Bangladesh, we had parallel police reform projects. And we also invested separately in ADR, so the big Bangladeshi uh, NGO alternative dispute resolution organizations like BLAST and Madaripur. Um, and so we talked, and I think Bill had touched on this trade-off and the equilibrium between these two systems. Well, I think for, for a donor in the early, um, pre-2010, these were separate systems to, you know, you try and direct poor vulnerable people to the, or the ADR system and you try and keep them away from the police system. And as Amy touched on, uh, and as can have in Anna's um, presentation, this thing about the, the ethical risks of introducing more contact between citizens and police was very much on our minds. Um, and whenever I used to talk about the police reform project in Bangladesh, I'd often um, quote uh, a man who said to me, you know, if you tell the police that your chicken has been stolen, they'll come and steal your goat. So the sense of um, avoid contact with the police at all costs, unless it's you know, truly impossible to resolve this in others for us. Um, we also invested a lot in with you know these big and tremendously impressive um, NGO ADR programs um, to try and address inclusion, um, gender equity, etc. But I have to say the the measurement of outcomes was always pretty difficult. Um, whenever we tried to embrace the whole system, you know, so in Bangladesh, somebody thought, why don't we try and let set out the whole security and justice system, and then we'll try and have a program that it, that covers the whole lot. And it became like a kind of um, a mad cyberpunk uh, machine that you could never stop drawing bits that actually should be included. And then that would make any sense of intervention um, more and more difficult. Now, to me, th this stuff used to blow my mind in that it was almost impossible as a, as a different governance advisor, you know, working partly, but not entirely on, on security and justice programs. To think of exactly what we should be doing. We'd spend money, but I was always con concerned that um, wasn't necessarily leading to much change. And then, as we touched on, context was critical, both context um, country to country, but also temporal context. So in Bangladesh, for example, you know, working with the police when the caretaker government stayed and uh, RAB, the Rapid, Rapid Action Bureau, uh, Battalion, was formed and became a bit of a, an elite paramilitary hit squad. You know, how do you engage with, with uh, police reform in those, in those terms? It was very difficult. Now, I haven't mentioned evidence yet because I have to say that um, prior to probably 2010, for me in working in police and justice reform, it was almost an evidence-free area. We relied on expertise, um, on best practice, which was largely you know, experts telling you what they did last time and then adding some, some bells and whistles. Um, I had a fairly profound um, sea change in my understanding when I first encountered JPAL, actually, 
and the work of the team working with uh, Nina Singh in Rajasthan. So basically, um, common police station level interventions that actually took these um, interventions, for example, is it worth having an NGO uh, person sitting in the um, police station? Can you adjust um, posting lengths and working days, working practices to, to try and um, have an effect on, on trust and engagement with the community and also survey data on, on experience of the police? And to me, this was this was like um, a bolt from the blue that there are actually rigorous things you could do in impact evaluation on, on policing and try and tease out this sense of, well, what are the outcomes we're actually caring about rather than, you know, you might say pouring more money into the police to do their thing, whatever it is. Um, so this took me on to my research commissioning role now, where we work with JPAL on the governance initiative and grew that into the, the JPAL and IPA ECCI. Um, and so then the insights from things like, I think Bilal and uh, Andrela Dubey's own work in, um, with Fambul Tok in Sierra Leone was also profoundly um, mind-changing in terms of you know, um, community reconciliation. Yes, DFID, old DFID did a lot of that. The idea that you could actually measure the outcomes and the fact that they wouldn't necessarily confirm what you believed to be true was a real eye-opener um, and really shook our system. Um, similarly, uh, work on uh, police, uh, body-worn cameras, et cetera, et cetera, um, was also quite profound in terms of building up this evidence base. So it's a brilliant investment for us. Um, when Amy started a presentation with a map of the GCCI investments, and I thought, this is truly impressive, but it's still very much the start of the journey. So the, the questions about you know James's work, uh, Anna's work, Bilal's um, over, overview, it's still, you know, these are these are the, the the drip drip drips in specific contexts of really um, insightful work that we need to build up and, uh, and replicate. And if you turn that, if we seek to turn that into policy, you know, this is um, going to take a hell of a lot of interpretation of multiple current and future um, research and experiments, and then trying to produce this into a so what for policymakers, which is still a profound um, challenge. Um, now, why do we invest in GCCI, the Governance Conflict um, Crime Initiative? It was partly because of a swinge in criticism of, of, of ex DFID's own investments in security and justice by our, uh, our independent um, reviewer of, of aid effectiveness. So that you know, we didn't just do this because we suddenly caught on to RCTs. We did this because of a profound challenge about spending lots of money and not being evidence-based. So we're still on that journey. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it very shortly. Um, Sorry, I'm not really reading the screen when you're sending me messages too, but um, I think there's a huge amount to chew on here. Uh, I, I'd love to see Anna's work taken to a slightly larger scale. And I, I take very seriously that point about, you know, at what, at what scale could one invest and actually um, seek to measure or affect police behavior? Um, from James's work, the, there's always a bit of interpretation needing, needed from labs in the field approaches. So, you know, I, I like them. Um, I have to interpret them for my policy colleagues so that they don't think that we're, um, we're playing games, that these actually have, have an effect. So I very much like James's point about, um, you know, we often focus on tax and taxation as, as the place where the state-citizen relationship starts, but predating that or uh, seeing that differently about a dispute resolution. Um, and then, um, Equi equi equilibrium business about um, you know addressing one part of the system and seeing an effect on the other, even though you didn't um, specifically try and stamp that out. I think that that's that's really really key. The final point I make is within the context of our work, we fund a huge range of of varied research, including in similar settings to the work presented presented today, including work on, on non-state public authority, including in Nepal, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I see the work presented today in, in the context of you know, ethnographic work on what do people do when they need services, what do people knew with, need when they have a, a dispute. Um, and the wider work of, of um, the centre where uh, that James leads, people like Chris Blackman. Uh, we had a seminar yesterday on the, the, the um, Medellin work, which I think started from an RCT and grew into a much more systematic engagement at city level, including with city authorities. So I hope that we can do more of those to put these these experimental insights into um, a more effective way of looking at a, a whole system. I'm thinking, 
well, what can we do about policy, testing policy and seeing change? So many thanks for the opportunity. I hope that wasn't too garbled. I've actually said different stuff than I thought I would, but that's partly a reflection of the, the richness and interest from the three speakers. Thank you very much. No, that's great, Peter. And it's great to hear you engage with the other presentations. Um, so now we can kind of switch over to the Q&A portion of this. So we've received several questions already. Um, but I think since this has come up a couple of times and Anna mentioned that she was willing to talk about it. So Anna, um, would you be able to share more about some of the precautions that you took in this study in regards to working with the police and uh, maybe any in implementation challenges that were a result of that? Yes, of course. So, I mean, studies of this kind in the study in particular have a multiple, raise multiple ethical issues on all fronts. Um, one of them having to do with the intervention and the working with the police, others having to do with keeping safe research staff, um, because typically they are conducted in quite high crime environments, um, and yet others uh, having to do with keeping um, keeping respondents safe, not necessarily as a result of the intervention, but also during the research project process in terms of what kind of questions to ask them, how to ask those questions, et cetera. So there are at least sort of three fronts of ethical issues, but um, I'll talk about the ones that relate to the intervention now, because that's, I think, what you have like sort of mainly been asking about. So in this particular case, um, I think there are sort of two, um, well, there, there are a bunch of things to think through. Um, one thing to think through is, um, from a researcher's perspective, how much am I intervening in a system and how would the world look if I am not intervening? So for example, with this um, alarm intervention, if I had designed this alarm intervention and came up with it myself, I think I would be much less confident with rolling it out um, than I, I am now where this is something that this nonprofit organization is doing. They would have installed these alarms without me um, too. And they have already done this in um, many different places in South Africa. So that is kind of helpful for me as a researcher to say, you know, I, I, I don't have to design this intervention myself. Um, I, can, I can rely on, on other people's um, sort of experience with this working out. In terms of the, the work with the police, so, um, and this is a small scale study, which Peter also just um, mentioned to some degree. And so that, of course, made a lot of things easier. So in this case, I worked very closely with the implementing partners in terms of selecting the right police precinct where to do the study. So this was a police station that um, you know was very well known to the implementing partner even prior to the study. So they had a lot of ties with police. So this was sort of one um, sort of easy thing for this particular study that we could kind of have an idea of what this particular police station is like because there's certainly um you know reports of police abuse in south africa as well but um there are other places where this is a bigger concern than the, this particular context so kind of vetting the poli particular police station you're working with is something you can do with a small scale project like this though necess not necessarily with a bigger um project of course where you're working with a lot of different police stations um the other, um, I think, important part, and this relates to a question that was asked in the chat, um, is how much information do people have and how much chances do they have to opt out and into this treatment? And there are a lot of uh, sort of trade-offs from a research design perspective around that too. So in my case, what I did is that um, I conducted a baseline survey during which I sampled the households that were ended up being in the study. And during this baseline survey, survey people received very detailed information on what the alarm system is like um, and were asked whether they would be interested in having an alarm system. And the vast majority of people were interested in having an alarm system. To some degree, this is maybe surprising because I'm also arguing that with the alarm system comes the supervisory role of the police. But it's actually not that surprising if you think about the fact that there is a lot of gun violence in this area. And so people are really do have a really high demand for protection. And so it didn't surprise me that much that the vast majority of people did want to have the alarm system. But from an ethical point, it was important to give them a lot of details on what the alarm does and give them a real chance of opting in or out. And the people who were not interested in an alarm, they were excluded from the random assignment prior to the random assignment even being done. So they were not part of the study. That raises issues in terms of how to generalize the results, but from an ethical standpoint, it's ultimately the only way you can conduct the study because you cannot um, you know, give people an alarm that they don't want and connect them to the police, given that there are risks that come with that. So that was another important part. And then finally, the NGO worked very closely with police in terms of training them on how to use the alarm system, etc. They have a backend system that follows up with all incidents that in which an alarm system gets triggered, so they can follow up on what happened in those 
cases um, and kind of have a, have an eye on. Like there, there's at least one more layer of responsibility, uh, accountability where the police knows that they are also watched by a nonprofit organization. So these were sort of the specific things we did in this study, some of which would be doable in other studies too, and some of which I think are particular to that context. That's great to hear um, kind of some of the steps that you took to think about these ethical concerns. Um, while we're already on the topic of kind of ethics of working with police or other state institutions um, that might be responsible for committing injustice themselves, um, is does anyone else want to kind of add to this discussion about some of the ethical concerns? Or if not, we can move to another question as well, but just give you all a chance. Okay, well, we also received kind of another category of questions uh, kind of related to how different forms of justice systems may differentially impact different segments of the population. So thinking about um, women, lower middle class, uh, based on literacy, um, how should we think about balancing state and non-state systems of dispute resolution in responding to the needs of different societal groups? And again, this question is open to anyone. Well, maybe I'll just give it a super quick step. So I think I, the, the question that I read also was about at some level about access and how do we, you know, get uh, people to go to courts. And I think ultimately we don't want anyone to have to go to court, right? Um, that's the last alternative that any of us has. None of us want to uh, individually want to take a dispute to court if we can avoid it. What The reason that we don't take disputes to court is because we know that courts function well um, and we have good information about what those courts um, cost. We have good information about the law and I think it's, I would think of it as, as uh, in, in the context of the shadow of the law, right? So there is a law out there, but then there are a series of institutions that in principle can implement the law. And so when I have a dispute with somebody else, we can resolve it ideally um, without going to any dispute resolution system because everybody is aware about what happens next and what the costs are. I think the biggest problems at some level in, in what everyone's been hinting at is that the shadow of the law is weak in, in many of these other places. And so to the extent that it's possible through any number of things, um, through the expansion of the state and its uh, institutions, through civic education programs, through working with traditional leaders and customary systems, et cetera, and through some of this forum's choice work where you're directing people uh, and giving them information about what is and is not okay under the law, at some level you're creating um, the option not to go to court but to resolve your disputes in any number of other ways because going to court is an exit strategy that becomes increasingly feasible so so i i guess my it's not so much a matter of uh who gets to go to court as much as a matter of who has the ability um to exercise those options and can credibly threaten to to to, to exercise those options the second thing I'd say is that it's really um, more of an empirical question. I don't know that there is enough information out there about, about who wins and who loses and whether how these systems are biased. So uh, I have a recent study with a bunch of colleagues in India where we scraped um, 80 million cases uh, from the Indian judiciary. It was actually an FCDO funded uh, through the Economic Development and Institutions um, uh, program. We've taken 80 million cases and identified the gender and religion of every single uh, disputant um, in those cases and every single judge in the in those cases. So we have something about 8 million crimes that were committed and we find zero evidence. And this is shocking to us, zero evidence of either gender or religious bias that's even rem remotely sort of numerically significant. So wherever we find a little statistical significance, the actual numbers are tiny, which tells me weirdly um, uh, that courts, once you get to court, things seem to be doing fine in India. But we also know that that can't be true because 
India is not doing fine on any number of other dimensions that relate to the protection of, of, of individuals. And so there is, I think that this really does speak to this big question of like, where does the discrimination happen? And who has access to these courts and these institutions? And so it really does bring us all the way back to what, what James and Anna have been, have been really saying is that the, the avenue of contestation, it's not necessarily sitting up in the court system itself, but it is in all of these kinds of informal areas. And, and, and I'm really kind of shocked at some level at how little we tend to know about what's happening uh, in those areas, which is why these studies are so important. Great. So we are running out of time, but maybe just to give you all a chance to kind of share any last reflections that you have on this topic, um, or if there's any uh, lingering remaining questions that you would uh, want to bring up as something that would be important to have extra evidence on um, in terms of the role of state and non-state institutions in providing justice. So kind of a last chance to uh, provide any input here. Maybe one thing that I would say um, in terms of bigger questions, and I think this is very similar to what Bilal said about general equilibrium effects. I think one thing that we don't um, study or that we cannot as easily study, it also relates to what Peter said in terms of studying systems, is the incentives of elites. So like, you know, the providers of justice, um, either being the, in the informal system or judges, politicians who decide how to um, structure formal justice systems, et cetera. That's just much more difficult to study in an experimental setting or generally to study empirically. And so um, I think there are a lot of open questions there, like how does the existence of informal systems change how the formal system provides justice um, do like to the extent that there is the competition that Bidal has mentioned, how does that competition structure, you know, what what kind of justice is provided, how effectively it is pro provided, um, how politicians, you know, invest in law enforcement, invest in the court system, um, people who decide sort of law enforcement policy. So I think that elite level is kind of where we just know much less. Peter, I see, I see you've unmuted yourself. Is there something you wanted to add before we close here? I was just gonna say that um, I think wherever we're sitting, if we look at our own police and justice systems, um, the uh, equity and the evidence of effectiveness is probably quite slim in mine, um, for example, particularly sitting here in the UK. Um, and the studies we've mentioned in this space in lower and middle income countries, you know, I, I may be wrong, but I think we could probably count most of them on on the, on the hands around the table here. So, you know, I I think about the, the Mexico uh, um, workers' courts study, which has given uh, good insights for for many, you know, or food for thought for many settings about what happens when you explain to ordinary people the likelihood of their settlement and how long it will, it will take and whether they really want to pursue uh, a court action. So I think that we're still um, in need of many, many, many more studies um, to test these sort of these bits of the system, but also in more context. So uh, it's been great listening today, but I, I just hope that we can uh, we can do more of this for more places and, and, and pick more of these big questions. Thank you. I think that's a common theme here. We need more research. Uh, but thank you all for attending the webinar, and especially thank you to the panelists for agreeing to present today. Um, and also a huge thank you to our colleagues over at IPA um, as part of the GCCI series. Thanks everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and end this now. Have a great day.